Better conditions than last night. Uh, our first speaker is going to be Mark Miller. Mark, just start at the beginning. Yeah, just, <laughs> just, just start over, and uh, we'll go from there. So let's bring him on with a hand. Mark Miller. I should look, oh, oh, that's definitely it. Woo, <clears throat> all right. When he said speakers should keep it within the rails, I, I tried to tell if he was looking in my direction, but those men with no eyes, sunglasses, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't be sure. That's right. <clears throat> well, good morning, gentlemen. <clears throat> it is a fabulous morning, isn't it? <laughs> it's a morning made to preach. <clears throat> We are just going to start off from the beginning because uh, you've f forgotten the first five minutes anyway. <laughs> so open your Bibles up to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. <clears throat> you guys don't look much the worse for wear tomorrow morning. That'll be a little different, but... <clears throat> the, uh, uh, the topic for me this weekend is, uh, is Satan and... That's an odd, I don't know if it's an odd topic, but maybe, maybe a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, Lewis said after he wrote the screw tape letters that that was a hard place for him to put himself mentally, uh, to imagine, you know, a, a different kind of, of, uh, uh, of uh, well, we'll talk about this, um, to, to put yourself in a place where it's really a, an irrational um, Anger and, and lust are the things that primarily motivate. And so it's a, it's a different headspace to be in. And so a lot of this, you know, some things just don't make sense. You, you know, you ever wonder why people do stupid things. And if you're trying to find a rational answer for irrational behavior, um, you might want to check whether that's a rational enterprise. But 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 describes a little bit of, uh, well, at least gives us our starting off point. Uh, let's start in chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 5. Paul says, Don't you remember, while I was still with you, I was telling you these things. You know what restrains him now, so in his time he may be revealed. The he to which Paul refers is what he calls the man of lawlessness and the son of destruction in verse 3. He, um, uh, he goes on to describe, he says, The mystery of lawlessness in verse 7, is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. Then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. Amen. That is, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power, signs, and false wonders, with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. <clears throat> it says, Verse 11, for this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so they might believe what's false in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. Let's pray. <clears throat> Great and awesome Father in heaven, <clears throat> Lord, it is our privilege and pleasure to be able to direct our thoughts toward the scriptures this morning and Father, uh, to you. Lord, we're grateful that... Uh, uh, that According to, uh, to your will and in your providence, um, we have the opportunity to be at Peaks again this year. Father, we're so grateful for, the, uh, um, for that blessing. So grateful, Father, for uh, all of these fellas who, um, um, who put spiritual things first, who, uh, um, who make the effort to be here from near and far, and, and uh, just really grateful, Lord, to be able to rub elbows with them uh, over the weekend. Father, we pray that... Um, that your word would have its perfect result, that, uh, um, that it would indeed go out and, and uh, not return to you without accomplishing the purpose for which you sent it. Father, help us to be good stewards of the scriptures this weekend. Lord, we pray that uh, we do right by your word. Father, we pray that, um, that you'd really be pleased um, with the result. Lord, may our faith be strengthened. May our, uh, uh, may our courage um, be, um, be filled up by the um, by the fellowship of the brethren and father help us to uh, uh, help us to be ready for the enemy the battle 
and the victory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, this chapter 2 passage in 2 Thessalonians <clears throat> is a pretty good description, <clears throat> obviously, of Paul's day, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't, uh, it's not very far removed from our day. <clears throat> Paul says there's two things at work. One he calls the man of lawlessness and the son of destruction. <clears throat> He said, uh, that lawless one will, will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. <clears throat> the scriptures often personify um, teachings, doctrines, <clears throat> uh, does that with the, the, the teaching or the doctrine of the Antichrist, right? So if you're reading through John's epistles, you'll find that John describes the Antichrist who is coming, <clears throat> right? Uh, but he describes him as a person. If you read more carefully, you find out that the, the Antichrist is not a person, but it's a doctrine, it's a teaching. Okay? But he's describing it in human terms as if it were a person. And the same is true here. The man of lawlessness is a personification of a, not just an individual, um, but it's a personification uh, of uh, really a, mm, what's the best, an influence um, or a, uh, um, really it's a coordinated effort. And what, what Paul's referring to, <clears throat> there's different names. He calls it different things throughout the scriptures, but the um, uh, Revelation uses the term false prophet to describe him. So if we just go over just a little bit, Revelation chapter 13. <clears throat> there's two beasts of Revelation chapter 13. <clears throat> the first comes out of the sea, and that's a description <clears throat> of human government. Okay. The second comes out of the earth, <clears throat> and that one's a description of human religion. So Revelation chapter 13, verse 11, says, I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He who had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. He makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. He performs great signs, which you saw that element in the second Thessalonians passage. So he even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. He deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which was given him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. There was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast might even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He caused all the small, the great, the rich, the poor, the free men, slaves to be given a mark on their right hand, their forehead provides that no one be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name or the number of the beast. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. The number of that is a man is number 666. I don't know what 666 means. Don't ask me. <clears throat> but so it's the second beast that works with the first if you read the, the first half of the chapter, so the, the first beast, his desire is, is through force to compel all mankind to worship the dragon by proxy, right? So the first beast, oh, how great is the beast? And that's human government, right? And it is, I mean, it is great and it is powerful. Right? Let's also work in cahoots, right, with the devil who is the God of this world, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. There's, a, there's an unholy alliance that has to take place in order to try and, and corral mankind into the worship of the dragon, either directly or indirectly. <clears throat> and they are two, and that is false government and, or bad government and bad religion. Okay. And the two have to go in, they two have to go together. Okay. They can't exist independently. False government or bad government, tyrannical government, government that oppresses the truth and unrighteousness. <clears throat> government requires an underlying worldview to justify its use of force. Okay. Alexander Solzhenitsyn said in his Nobel Prize uh, speech for literature, he says two things have to go together. He said violence and the lie. See, and violence is just raw power, right? But even raw power needs an underlying, um, uh, an underlying worldview, a, a paradigm that justifies that kind of use of force. And so uh, raw power looks to some kind, of a, some kind of justification for its existence and its use. 
And so that's the lie. And Solzhenitsyn brought out the point, he said, you know, bad government, tyrannical government can't exist in the absence of the lie, right? And so <clears throat> he said, if you stand up for what is true, yeah, there'll be consequences, but don't ever, well, there's an old Russian proverb that says, one word of truth will overturn the whole world. Okay. Two things, the violence, which is force, and the lie, <clears throat> which is the thing which justifies it. Now, why would anyone believe the lie? Well, because of the violence that compels people not to speak. Okay. But why would anyone allow see, that kind of violence of force? Well, because this is the worldview that justifies that action. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 13 describes both of those. And he says they both work in cahoots with the dragon. The purpose is to, to wrest from men the worship that belongs rightfully only to God. And that's going to be a common theme um, throughout the morning here. <clears throat> Back to 2 Thessalonians, it says the Lord's going to deal with him. <clears throat> and you can see this in Revelation chapters 19 and 20. The Lord's going to deal with him <clears throat> when he comes at the appearance of his coming. He says the one who's coming is in accord, I'm in verse 9 now, with the activity of Satan, with all power, signs, and false wonders, with all the deception and wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. That's a really important point. Um, it says... And they receive a deluding influence, and um, that's brought out well in Romans chapter 1. They believe what is false. In order, in verse 12, that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. Why, why would anyone believe the lie? I mean, if I take, if I take this, uh, this piece of wood here and I set it up there on our, uh, on our rudely constructed altar... And, and we fall down and worship the piece of wood. I mean, you got to be half brain dead to do that, right? Uh, also, don't make any mistake. The ancients didn't worship the idols. They worshiped those forces behind the idols. Okay, the ancients weren't foolish. Okay, if anything, it's the materialist currently who's foolish, who thinks that that's all there was to, to idol worship. But if somebody sets up a, a, you know, a chunk of wood, stone, Gold, silver, precious stone, whatever it is. <clears throat> and they fall down. I mean, really? I mean, Jeremiah, I believe it was, says, don't you know there's a lie in your right hand? So when you do, I mean, isn't that obvious? The answer is, okay, good. We're awake this morning. <clears throat> it just bothers me to have that up there now. <clears throat> but... <clears throat> Don't you know there's a lie in your right hand? And that's crazy stuff, isn't it? That's why would anybody believe that? Well, the reason is they did not, one, in verse 10, receive the love of the truth. So they allowed themselves to be deceived. And why would they allow that? Verse 12 provides the answer. They did not believe the truth, but they took pleasure in wickedness. All false religion has as its underlying hook pleasure in wickedness and so idolatry always justifies bad behavior okay. now if uh, if you're thinking that maybe that's what the denominational world does too you're right okay. i mean it's one thing to to fall down before the bales and the ashereth right and to participate in the immorality that they uh, uh, that they promote okay. but how different is that from the guy who says, I'm a sinner saved by grace and I'm always going to sin. I can't help but sin. I'm going to sin all the time. Which one excuses sin? Well, of course, they both do, don't they? Sure, it's just, well, why would they believe what is false? Yeah, because there's a reason to believe. There's something you got to know about evil. And um, uh, this is, you need this, I think, in order to make sense of it. Um, if, you're trying, if you're trying to make sense of, uh, of evil, you've got to understand um, evil is not rational. Now, don't misunderstand me. Evil is intelligent. But it's not rational. Do you think Satan's read the end of the book? 
You think maybe he knows how, how, it, how it finishes off? Yeah, I'm guessing he did too. So, you can do that at Peaks. <clears throat> Can't do that in Missoula. <clears throat> but he's read the end of the book, hadn't he? So wouldn't you think, right, to conduct himself? No. The reason is, I'll give you this example. A long time ago, there was a, um, uh, there was a Batman movie, right? And in the, I don't remember if it's a beginning scene or whatever it was, um, but it's a bank robbery, right? That's pretty clever. There's a, there's a, there's a group of, of these bank robbers. Of course, they're all in masks because that's how you have to do it. If you're going to rob a bank, you need, to, you need to wear masks. So they're wearing masks, and <clears throat> they're all going to rob this bank, right? And there's half a dozen or so of them. And so uh, one guy, you know, it's his job to cut the power or whatever to the building and make sure that they can't dial dial out for help and um, so he does his job and as soon as he does his job the guy who's next to him shoots him and there's another guy and his job is to break the vault door right and so he breaks the vault door and the vault door opens and that and the robber next to him shoots him and then they're loading up all these bags of cash right and they're getting the bags of cash ready and they get them all out of the vault and they get them over Right, and he shoots the next guy. And then the guy gets out of the getaway car or whatever it is that they were throwing the cash into, and he shoots the last guy. There's no honor among thieves. Well, why would they have suspected there was? <laughs> Evil's irrational because it's a desire for wickedness. It's a desire for the gratification that comes from doing wrong that is the driving force behind it. Now, you understand that because if you ever commit a sin, is it rational? Or has the desire to do that thing just kind of pushed outside, the, pushed the objective rational mind to the, to the margins? That's what evil is. And it amazes me that <clears throat> people, they, re, they refuse to see it. Right? It's such a, such a great illustration of exactly what's going on in our culture right now. Because everybody thinks that they're going to stab everybody else in the back, but they're going to get theirs. You know, the appeal of socialism is not the poor. The appeal of socialism is I'm going to go ahead and vote for this or support this, but underlying that is the desire that I'm going to get mine, sucker. I'm going to get mine. But the idea or the, the, you know, what's pitched on the outside, so it gives it the justification. So it sounds rational. It sounds, it sounds even compassionate, doesn't it? It gives it the, it gives it the, the, uh, the patina of, of, of compassion and even righteousness, right? How could you not love the poor? But the underlying pitch is always what's in it for them. And it amazes me. As, and they should figure this out. Evil, the left, always eats its own. Right? It, it's, you know, where are, where, is the, where are the women's liberation movement now? as, you know, what's-his-name continues to dominate swimming. You know, where are women's rights? They've been thrown aside, haven't they? They're, they're out. Sorry, you're no longer the most protected class. <clears throat> so you're gone. What about gay rights? They're gone, man. <clears throat> there are no gay rights anymore. A lot of the, the gay community is really upset by the, by the trans community. They are. <clears throat> because... People who used to, to, to grow up, see, and be ripe for, for, uh, um, for recruitment into the gay community are now being changed as trans, you know, before they even, before they even reach a, an age where they can make that decision. So the gay community is all up in arms because you're taking all of our recruits. That's true. <clears throat> they always eat their own. Always. <clears throat> Why? Because they took pleasure in wickedness and they did not believe the truth. 
we're going to work through a, a lot of material this morning, but I'm going to stay within the rails. <laughs> Turn to Ezekiel chapter 28. <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter 28 gives you a picture. <clears throat> I just want you to understand th that's, that's why the devil does what he does. It's not rational. <clears throat> it's because there's a, there's a lust for the gratification that comes <clears throat> from doing what he does. There's a pleasure in wickedness <clears throat> and then when that pleasure, you know, becomes the center of your focus, that's all you can think about. <clears throat> In Ezekiel chapter 28 describes famously the king of Tyre. And the king of Tyre <clears throat> forms a good backdrop or, or comparison in the mind of, uh, of, the, of the spirit to another authority. In, um, in verse 12, he says, Son of man, take up a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You are in Eden, the, uh, the garden of God. Well, that should tell us right away we're not talking about the guy who lives in the fortress on the sea in the city of Tyre. Rather, we're talking about someone else. Every precious stone was your covering, ruby, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, lapis, lazuli, turquoise, emerald, gold, workmanship of your settings and sockets was in you on the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were the anointed cherub who covers, and I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created. Right? Everything I mean, is gorgeous, beautiful. Every precious stone was your covering. Seal of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. See, something went wrong, though. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence and you sinned. Therefore, I've cast you as profane from the mountain of God and I have destroyed you, O covering cherub. He uses that twice, verse 14, verse 16. He describes him um, as, a, as a cherub. From the midst of the stones of fire, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I put you before kings that they may see you. By the multitude of your iniquities and the unrighteousness of your trade, you profaned your sanctuaries. Therefore, I brought fire from the midst of you. It's consumed you. I've turned you to ashes on the earth. In the eyes of all who see you, all who know you among the peoples are appalled at you. You've become terrified. You will be no more. <clears throat> Oftentimes, you know, when the prophets look forward, the Spirit gives them kind of a contemporary or a, or a physical view. But then sometimes the lens of the camera shifts focus and it looks to that thing which is behind what's visible. Right? <clears throat> and the king of Tyre is, is all that in a bag of chips. He thinks he's untouchable in his sea fortress. <clears throat> but... The bigger issue is another fella who also believes he's untouchable, right? <clears throat> Corrupted in his own mind by, a, uh, by his own imaginations. Corrupted, <clears throat> he says, you are, by the abundance of your trade, you're internally filled with violence. He had all of those things. <clears throat> it's a picture, obviously, of how Satan leaves, for, for better, lack of a better term, leaves the rational thought behind in pursuit of the pleasure of wickedness. In John chapter 8, Jesus is having a rather heated discussion with the Pharisees. <clears throat> and he says, you're of your father, the devil. In fact, let's go there because I want to bring out a couple of things from that passage. John chapter 8. <clears throat> We're in verse 44. <clears throat> so you're of your father, the devil. You want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he's a liar and the father of lies. He says two things, violence and the lie. He said he was a murderer from the beginning. Now, I don't know that I could say with complete certainty when the beginning was to which Jesus here refers. Okay. Uh, possibly it was before the Garden of Eden and the, and the incident with Eve, but it's also possible that that was the point 
and what she said, the scripture doesn't make that entirely clear. <clears throat> what does make clear is he's internally filled with violence and he sinned, according to the Ezekiel passage. He said, you were a murderer from the beginning. It's who he is. You know, liar is the father of lies. People who, uh, <clears throat> there's, you know, there's murders that are crimes of, you know, crimes of passion. <clears throat> murders that it's just so, you know, blind with rage. Um, but then there's another kind of murder. There's the kind of murder um, where uh, people kill other people because they like it. He was a murderer from the beginning because he likes it. It's who he is. There's a thrill, right, connected with breaking the law. And the bigger the violation, the greater the thrill. The, <clears throat> the, 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 greater, the, the greater the sin, the greater the high. He was a murderer from the beginning. Adam and Eve, pretty innocent in the garden. They've not had their senses trained to determine good and evil. They're just, they're kids really in, in, in a sense. I mean, they know better. But the subtle serpent, sweetheart, you're not going to die. Don't you want to be like God? To know good and evil? Wouldn't you like to know? You're not going to die. He was a murderer from the beginning. He gets his hits. Off the greater the sin, the greater the high. Is it irrational? Yep. But people who murder for sport are not rational people. Don't make the mistake. They are unintelligent. But they're not rational. The mindset, got to have the hit, got to have the high, no matter what it costs. If you try and, you know, try and reason with evil, is, uh, is a fool's errand. Um, understand clearly, there's no, there's no reasoning with evil. Okay? And, and there's no court to which evil uh, will subject itself. None. Okay? If, you ask, if you ask the murderer, sir, here's the body of evidence against you. Here are the witnesses to the crime. Here's the physical evidence. <clears throat> it's clear, you know, to, to 12, 12 of your peers that, uh, that you are guilty of the crime. What's he, what's he likely to, to respond? Wasn't me. Not me. I didn't do it. I didn't, whatever. <clears throat> you're not going to reason with evil. Think you're going to reason with the left? No. Because they're both motivated by a different thing, aren't they? I want to get my hits. So you, can't, you, can't, you can't sit down and say, don't you realize that this is a better way? It doesn't matter to them. So they're just going to get what they want. Evil's that way. So there's no court. There's no, you're not going to sit down and, and look at the evidence and you know what? I am guilty, actually. And so... Every conflict with evil always must, of necessity, devolve to a contest of force. The only reason that that evil is kept, at, you know, at a at a at a, a balance can be maintained inside of, of of developed societies is because force is on the side of law. And as you notice, that begins to shift. Evil takes advantage of the opportunity. In uh, <clears throat> John, he says, 
You have your father, the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own nature. <clears throat> it's strange to me that when, um, when people have different psychopathies, when they, um, when they justify or when they describe their crimes, um, there's always a reason for it. You know, I had to do it because such and such. I needed this or they deserved it. Um, but <clears throat> something happens in the mind when you embrace the doing of wrong. <clears throat> the, lie has to, the lie has to come with it in order to continue the behavior. <clears throat> they develop a picture of the world that's, that, is, that serves their own purpose, that allows them to just or gratify their own desires. Um, just a quick note on cherubim. Cherubim's an interesting thing. Um, in the Old Testament, you see them a lot. Cherubim are the only exception to the rule. You should make no image uh, of, any, uh, of, any, uh, of any animal, creature, thing like that. Um, you know, the, the commandment was clear, right? Don't make any graven images, but the one exception to that was the cherubim. The cherubim were, um, were prominently displayed inside the tabernacle uh, and the temple, its successor. <clears throat> there were um, images of cherubim on the curtains. There were images, there were two cherubim um, on top of the, of the mercy seat of the ark. And in Solomon's temple, there were two monstrous cherubim um, that, that uh, reached from wall to wall in the Holy of Holies, um, their wings just nearly touching all the way from one side to the other. Cherub is a, is a word that doesn't have a definition per se. It's a proper name. Um, there's another one I think that's worthy of note, but it only shows up in Isaiah chapter 6 uh, a couple of times, and that's the word seraphim. Seraphim um, is not necessarily a, a, a proper name. Seraphim is a descriptive term. And uh, so seraphim, for example, shows up in, uh, in Numbers 21, um, remember when uh, the people were, were grumbling in the wilderness and the Lord said, well, no problem. I'll give you something to complain about. And, uh, and he sent snakes out into the people. You remember that? Right. And they were fiery serpents. Right. And so uh, the word seraphim uh, really just means fiery serpent. And so Numbers 21, there were a bunch of seraphim sent out into the, um, in, into the, into the people. Um, so, but it, it means literally, it means fiery serpent. Isaiah uses it, and Isaiah's, you know, in his vision in chapter 6, he sees the throne of glory, and he sees the seraphim uh, around. Um, there's a few Greek words used to describe, that might come into English as serpent, and um, one is uh, ophis, uh, another is pythos, which obviously you'll recognize, and the, uh, the third is dracon, and, and any of those can be translated uh, as serpent, a couple are used in, uh, in Revelation chapter 12 in description of our adversary. In Revelation chapter 12, in, uh, in verse 9, he says, The great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, who is thrown down to the earth. His angels were thrown down with him. Uh, dracon is what comes into English as dragon, and serpent is ophis in the Greek. He's literally called the red serpent, great red dragon from chapter 3. Red dragon, red serpent, literally means seraphim. The seraphim is a Hebrew word, um, but you can check this out on your own if you like. I suspect that cherubim and seraphim are the same thing. That cherubim is the proper name. Seraphim is the descriptive term. But they, uh, they refer to the same angelic beings. And Satan is called a cherub in, uh, uh, in the Ezekiel passage. And here he's described as a red serpent or red dragon, which literally means seraphim. Okay. <clears throat> Point being is there's no higher order of creature than this, second to God himself. Now, these guys are the, are the ones who are around the throne. Uh, they cover the throne everywhere. They, everywhere the spirit goes, they go. Um, and you can, you can 
piece some of that together from the Old Testament. We don't have a lot of time to do that. Um, all I want to point out to you is this guy's at the top of his game, created to be the covering cherub, the anointed cherub who covers. But man, something goes wrong in his head. <clears throat> and the result is he's a murderer from the beginning. He leads a rebellion in Matthew chapter 25. I want to hurry along here. Matthew chapter 25, verse 14. He uses the term the devil and his angels. Uh, excuse me, not 14, 41. Matthew 25, <clears throat> 41. Jesus said, He will say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. In Jude uh, chapter 1, verse 6, he describes how there were angels that left their proper abode. As long as we're in Matthew, just back up to chapter 12. Matthew 12 and verse 26. Well, let's start in 25. Jesus is making a, a defense to the, uh, the Pharisees who have accused him of uh, casting out demons by Beelzebul, the ruler of demons. And in verse 25, Jesus responded. He said, Any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and any city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then shall his kingdom stand? Okay. So uh, Satan has at his command evil spirits who left their proper abode, their angels in their own right, <clears throat> but uh, decided... Uh, by whatever means, that uh, they were going to follow his command instead. And, uh, and there's a hierarchy and an order and a chain of command. <clears throat> if Satan casts out, casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. Jesus said that's not the way it works, right? Any house divided against itself will not stand. So there is a uniformity of purpose. Again, it's a, it's a short-term uh, willingness to cooperate because I'm going to get mine, right? You see strange, strange collaborations in the world. Have you noticed that? I mean, wow. The left makes for some strange bedfellows. How is it? How is it that the Muslims can be on board with the, with the, the left in, the, in our culture? I have a, that's weird. Because all the things that are anathema to them, the left embraces. How's that possible? Because as soon as he gets through the vault, I'm going to shoot him anyway. It just, gets, it just furthers my, my personal agenda. I'm just going to make it a little bit farther. And if I have to use this guy and discard him, who cares? Right? Doesn't matter. <clears throat> Doesn't matter. There is, uh, they're willing to cooperate in the short term. They're willing to, to work together. Satan doesn't cast out Satan. His house is not divided. And they communicate. In Acts 19, when uh, some uh, uh, overambitious sons of Sceva decide that they're going to cast out a demon, right? Uh, they come to him and they say, well, we cast you out in the name of Jesus and whom Paul preaches. Yeah, that's good. Because dropping one name is good. Two names is better, right? And do you remember, man, that demon looks over at those seven boys. He's like, fellas, let's get this straight. I recognize Jesus. And I know about Paul. But I don't know you. And then he beat them all senseless, right? <clears throat> right? Well, what's, what's going on? How does he know about Paul? Maybe personal experience. <laughs> A house divided or a house united requires communication. They got to know. They got to pass information back and forth. <clears throat> Our enemy's not stupid. Um, the nature of, of evil isn't stupid. It's not irrational. Or the nature of, of evil is irrational. It's not stupid. It's madness. At its very core, it's intelligent madness bent on getting the high that comes from hurting and, and, and from violating the Lord's command. <clears throat> Generally, that takes the form of hurting other people. Sadism is the, is, is the stock in trade. The devil left heaven, <clears throat> took his angels with him, 
right? And so you see this adversarial relationship between him and the Lord uh, brought out in Job. Uh, you can see uh, something similar in Zechariah chapter 2. There he's, uh, he's not accusing Job, he's accusing Christ in, uh, of, uh, of having violated or being in violation of the law. But in 1 John chapter 3, let's turn over there please, 1 John chapter 3. A lot, of, a lot of damage got done. Romans chapter 5 describes how, <clears throat> how death spread to all men, right? Because all sinned. Well, what happened? I mean, <clears throat> Adam opened the door, as it were, right? And so death spread to all men because all sinned. Well, the works of the devil are huge. He caused, he caused death to enter a world that uh, previously was, uh, was one of, of uniform life. And then through his, through his temptation and others caused the, really the world to fall into sin and ultimately into death. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, it says, The one who practices sin is of the devil. The devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Jesus went about the process of setting things to right. Now, I don't know of a better way to illustrate this, but, um, you know, if, if we all brought our, our laptops up here and, and started sharing flash drives and somebody has a, has a virus, well, I don't know how long it'd take before all of our equipment was infected. Well, this works kind of the same way in, in the world. You know, we all start off with a clean slate. It doesn't take very long for the world to start corrupting those flash drives through your own participation. <clears throat> but pretty soon, everybody's got it. Well, now what do you do about it? You order a new laptop, don't you? <laughs> you get antivirus software that you can never get rid of. <laughs> Is that what, you, what, what What do you do to solve that? Well, see, there's... There's, a, there's an antivirus for that thing. There's a, there's a program that works to undo what's been done. Right? And Jesus is that solution. And it gets passed around just the same way that sin and death got passed around. But it under, falls under a different jurisdiction. Jesus is in the process of undoing what has been done to destroy the works of the devil. In uh, Luke chapter 10, we won't go there, but in verse 18, the 12 get back and Jesus says, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. In Revelation chapter 12, and we will look at this one, it's really the fulfillment of what Jesus was anticipating when he spoke to the disciples in Luke 10. Revelation chapter 12, <clears throat> in, uh, in verse 7, it says, There was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon, the dragon the dragon and his angels waged war. They were not strong enough and there was no place uh, found in heaven for them. The great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth. His angels were thrown down with him. I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation, the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down who accuses them before our God day and night. And he overcame them, they overcame him, excuse me, because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony, they did not love their life even to death. For this reason, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Well, what's, what's cause for rejoicing? Man, don't you love the story of Robin Hood? Don't you love the Robin Hood story? Man, I love the Robin Hood story. Right? King Richard, the lion-hearted, goes off to to fight the uh, unwashed masses, the, the, the hordes of invasion. King Richard goes off to fight the war, and in his place, John. Prince John, the phony king of England, right? You guys need to watch more cartoons. <clears throat> right? Prince John decides that this is his moment. Right? And he's going to take the throne. He's going to take the throne 
He's going to keep it for himself. He's going to rule like a tyrant in the land, right? And that dirty sheriff of Nottingham comes to tax the poor people. Don't you like Robin Hood? Stands up for the right. Now, he's been kind of co-opted by a socialist, but <clears throat> don't you appreciate somebody who's willing to stand up for the, the true king? Long live King Richard. Don't you appreciate that? You know what's great? Man, when King Richard comes back and he deals with John, that murderous usurper, and he sets to right everything that's been made wrong. When he sets prisoners free from the dungeon, right? when he looses them from oppression, right? and when a benevolent king once again sits on the throne. Don't you love that story? Maybe I've taken a little bit of liberty with the Disney version, but you get the idea, right? You see the same thing repeated, right? In the Lord of the Rings trilogy, the return of the king, right? Is not given to you, steward, to prevent the return of the king. The rightful king sits on his rightful throne. And that happened in Revelation chapter 12, or is described there for us. When the rightful king cast out the murderous usurper, threw him out, and set things to right. Rejoice, O heavens, you who dwell in them. Why? Their king has come. Their king has come. He's set to right. In that realm, in his, in his um, capital city, in Zion itself, he is set to right. He has undone the works of the devil. And they threw him out. Praise God. And the rest of his minions with him. However, woe to the earth. <laughs> In verse 12, right? Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil's come down to you. And boy, is he mad. <clears throat> Heaven's been restored in the sense that the king is seated where he belongs. But earth, if you haven't noticed, remains very much in rebellion. <clears throat> He's called, then we alluded to this earlier, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 uses the term the God of this world to describe the devil. <clears throat> and, you know, he's, he's done a pretty decent job of it. Um, he makes the offer to Jesus in Luke chapter 4. You can see all the kingdoms of the world. In a moment of time, you can see all their glory. And all it's going to take is, I'll give them to you. You just got to fall down and worship me. Well, that's heady stuff, you know, especially from a you know, low, lowly guy from Nazareth uh, to see all the glories of all the kingdoms that ever were and then, <clears throat> and then to have it offered to you. And it just requires this one little thing. You just got to bow down and worship me. Now, do you suppose, uh, Jesus doesn't, doesn't describe, uh, number one, he doesn't call his bluff. He doesn't say, ah, 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 you can't do that. I, I know that's, um, Jesus uh, seems to imply um, that he recognizes that's exactly the kind of authority that the devil wields. He says, <clears throat> no, I'm not doing that. <clears throat> but more than that, do you think if somebody wants to rule the world, they still have to make the same deal? Maybe Satan's kind of a hands-off approach guy. You think? Just let people do it. No, I don't think so. Not according to Revelation 13 we read. If you're going to rule the world, make no mistake, it's going to, you are going to sell your soul. Because <clears throat> that kind of power doesn't share power unless it's to their advantage. <clears throat> you suppose the guys today that rule the world have had to make the same deal? You bet they have. You bet they have. <clears throat> but they operate quietly 
or I should say, they try and they try and blunt the blunt the, the truth. Um, I did not enjoy the um, some of the things I wanted to finding some of the things I wanted to bring to you. Um, but here's a quote that I think is worth repeating uh, in your presence. Um, this is taken from a, a uh, they would style themselves as something of an authority on Satanism. That's as much reference I'm going to give you. Since the Satanist understands that all gods are fiction, instead of bending a knee in worship to or seeking friendship or unity with such mythical entities, he, that is the Satanist, places himself at the center of his own subjective universe as his own highest value. The, uh, uh, this year in April in Boston um, was a, was a uh, Satan conference, conference of Satanists. It was openly publicized. Um, if you didn't get the email, that's probably good. Um, but, <clears throat> uh, but, and from all accounts, it looks like it's pretty much a nothing burger, but, but it's out of the bag. It, it, it's, it's becoming more mainstream. And the way that they intend to do that, you notice, is that we don't believe in any, in any supernatural entities. That includes Satan himself. So ask the Satanist publicly if Satan exists, and his answer is no. The only thing that exists, the only God that you need to serve is you. Now, does that appeal to a segment of the population? Yeah, I think it might have some market, some market appeal. Alex, or, uh, um, uh, no, 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 no. <clears throat> um, Saul Alinsky, in his uh, in his book Rules for Radicals, um, dedicated uh, the book, which is designed to help um, to help the to help the masses overthrow the uh, whatever established forms uh, of infrastructure and government there are. He dedicated it to Lucifer, who led the first great revolution. Think those guys? Know? They know. They know. This is just drivel for idiots who, who like to view themselves or think of themselves as the center of their own universe, the God of their own domain. But if you go down that road, it, it's always great, isn't it? I mean, the French Revolution is such a super example of this principle, right? We threw off the oppressors, didn't we? Oh, and, and isn't that great? We got rid of that oppressive form of government. We, we got rid of the, you know, all of the marquises, and we got rid of the princes of France, and we killed the king. Oh, and it's great, isn't it? Now we live in an ideal society. You remember what followed? It's called the reign of terror. And they always eat their own. Always question that people should be asking if they're going to throw off <clears throat> the forms the uh, the infrastructure the if they're going to throw off the established um, the established rules of, of conduct for a society what do they intend to replace them with because the people who are always pushing for agitating you know, and and the destruction of those norms have another plan always have another plan those guys marching in the streets or storming the Bastille are just useful idiots. That's all they are. And they're going to get eat. People who believe <clears throat> that he places himself at the center of his own subjective universe as its own highest value are nothing but useful idiots. And they're all going to get eat. <clears throat> in, uh, what are we going to do about it? I'm going to try and finish this up quickly. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4 and uh, verse 20, verse 27, he says, don't give the devil an opportunity. Second Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 says, you need to be alert to Satan's 
schemes. First Peter 5, 8 talks about a, a, a prowling lion <clears throat> roaring about seeking someone to devour that someone is you. So you should, uh, you should be wary. You should be on the alert. But turn to Mark, uh, Mark chapter 3. There are some things, fellas, I think particularly um, need to be in, in, in your head. Um, you got to maintain a clean conscience. One of the greatest schemes of the devil is to, is to defile the individual's conscience. If you've got a guilty conscience, you're not really of much use. Because you can't be bold without a clean conscience. You can't be brave without a clean conscience. There's no courage in the presence of guilt. You're not going to stand up for what is true if you've got something behind you that you're trying to hide. Fellas, make sure, number one, you've got a clean conscience. Okay. Number two, be aware, Satan works to try always to divide and conquer. It's a, it's a recurring theme in the New Testament that those deceitful doctrines of demons <clears throat> are used to, to try and, and divide people and, and divide congregations. One of the second, perhaps, in my view, only to the truth of the scriptures in value to our group that we hold is the unity that we have together. Okay. Fellas, that doesn't happen by accident, and it's not maintained by accident. Be each other's keeper. And guard especially against suspicions between congregations. We work this thing together or we don't work it at all. You absolutely have to understand that we're in this boat and throwing people overboard is, is not an effective, is, is not the way to keep it afloat. Right? We got to maintain a spirit of unity in the bond of peace that absolutely is super essential. The scripture or the, the devil would love nothing more than to have us scrapping between ourselves, looking to carve up this or that. Fellas, pray. Pray that he's not successful in doing that. Those, those opportunities, those, that's coming. Fellas, use your heads. Stay in the game. Okay. Preserve the unity that is so necessary and which he would so desperately like to destroy. Finally, uh, Mark chapter 3. I use the term finally in a very loose <laughs> sense. Um, it's a figurative finally, um, symbolic really. Um, Mark chapter 3, in uh, verse 24, it's similar to the Matthew passage we read, but I want you to catch something here. In verse 24, if a kingdom is divided against itself, the kingdom cannot stand. A house is divided against itself, the house will not be able to stand. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but he's finished. No one can enter the strong man's house and plunder his property unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sins shall be forgiven the sons of men, whatever blasphemies they utter. Whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, is guilty of an eternal sin, because he doesn't want it forgiven. And I'm not going to talk about that. The point is, <clears throat> so if there's a strong man who guards his house, right, he's safe. His possessions are safe. What if a stronger man comes and binds that man? Well, then it's called a fire sale, right? So... Th then you get to plunder the house. Turn back to Isaiah 49 for just a moment. Isaiah chapter 49, <clears throat> verse 24. The Lord asks this great question. He says, can the prey be taken from the mighty man or the captives of a tyrant be rescued? Well, that's a good question, isn't it? How are you going to do that? 
or you're going to have to have somebody bigger, aren't you? Surely thus says the Lord, even the captives of the mighty man will be taken away. The prey of the tyrant will be rescued. Well, well who's held captive by the devil to do his will? Second Timothy, I think it's chapter 2, uses that description of those who are caught in darkness. Right? So they're held captive by the devil to do his will. Can the captives of a mighty man be taken away? Can the prey of the tyrant be rescued? Look at the second half of verse 25. The Lord says, I will contend with the one who contends with you. I will save your sons. I will feed your oppressors with their own flesh. They will become drunk with their own blood as with sweet wine. All flesh will know, I, the Lord, am your Savior. And your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Now, in conclusion, <laughs> Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. <clears throat> Let's start in about verse 7. When the thousand years are complete, Satan will be released from his prison. The thousand years, just to give you the brief version, is the church age. Will come out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. They came up on the broad plain of the earth, surrounded the camp of the saints, the beloved city, Fire came down from heaven, devoured them. And the devil, who deceived them, was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also. And they'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. Good riddance. I put that last part in. <clears throat> he says Satan's going to be released, and he's going to do something. He's going to start to deceive the nations. Okay. To do what? Deceive them into war. He uses an interesting phrase, description in that section. He says he's going to bring them all. He's going to bring Gog and Magog. That's weird. What are Gog and Magog? Well, if you've been reading Ezekiel lately, you remember that Gog and Magog are the nations <clears throat> that come against a, uh, a, group of, a group of people, actually. In, uh, I believe it's chapter 39 and 40. <clears throat> that group of people is from chapter 37. Remember Ezekiel 37, the vision of dry bones, right? And there's this great army that stands on their feet. And I think it's chapter 38. God takes those people, that great army, and he gives them their own land. And he sets them securely on their own land where they live in peace in unwalled villages. It's a peaceful place. Gog and Magog decide that they're going to go and they're going to conquer that city that peaceful land, they're going to conquer it. They're going to take it for themselves. And you know what happens? That peaceful city slaughters them. And the, the, the carnage is immense. Okay. That's the picture of Revelation 19. Okay. The Lord's going to bring Satan to his end. And it won't be because he recognizes the authority of the king. Because every contest of evil always devolves to force. That battle that gets fought, you fight. Who do you suppose they are? Clothed in white linen, following, following the king on his horse. That's you. You're going to fight it. And I'm going to fight it. And we're going to fight it with each other. It's not hyperbole, and it's not just, it's not, um, it's not just talk. When Paul finishes the letter to the Romans in chapter 16, he says, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Wouldn't you like things to be put to right? Get rid of Prince John. Reinstall the true king, the one who deserves to sit on the throne. 
not the murdering usurper, not his defiled minions. Don't you wait for the day when it is on earth as it is in heaven, when Jesus finally extends his kingdom and his reign to that last vestige that holds out for the devil and his angels and drives them out. When enough is enough and the rightful king again is recognized when every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord and he will reign until he's put every enemy under his feet. Thanks so much, fellas. Go get him.